July 25 Chicago Tribune under the title of A Couple of Couples. Jordan, on board a flight to Hawaii, overshadowed a newly wedded couple's Maui honeymoon. Upon landing, a white Rolls Royce, a red convertible and a golf cart were parked on the runway. MJ's luggage went into the convertible. Jordan hopped into the Rolls and the newlyweds got on the golf cart and everybody drove away. How good is that? That's one of the best things I found throughout this research. Yeah, that's amazing. (laughs) Quite incredible. That is one of the tidbits of all three seasons that we've covered so far. (laughs) I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. (laughs) I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB87, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls in the 1987 NBA season. Now here's your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome to the first episode of NB87. If you're new to the show, welcome. Regular listeners, welcome back. Aaron, thanks again for joining me, mate. Look forward to another great season of the NB franchise. Going to be breaking down the 86-87 NBA season. How are you, mate? And welcome back. Great to be back, mate. Uh, Looking forward to developing a more intimate relationship with the Bulls 86-87 season. And can you imagine, Adam, 33 hours. (laughs) 33 hours, Adam. That's just over a return trip to the United States. What better way to spend that return flight than listening to 33 hours worth of content, NB85, NB86, a more detailed rundown on the Bulls, 85 and 86 seasons, you will never find. It will never be topped. We've received a handful of great podcast reviews and specifically ones that mention the NB franchise leading up to the debut of NB87. We'll read the three of them in chronological order throughout this episode. The first two are from diehard fan of the show, Curtis Martin, aka KMartin81 on Twitter. And his first review is titled, Great Show. And it reads, Great show as always. I especially enjoy when you guys go over the season reviews and I hear stories that were written back then. Thanks for making my commute to work a little more enjoyable. NBA, news, notes and quotes, 1986, pre-NBA draft. Now, mate, of course, it's not possible for us to track Michael Jordan's every move during the offseason, but we've done our best collectively to document where he was at certain times in the lead-up to this 86-87 season commencing. Interestingly, on June 8, and that was the date that Boston won their 16th NBA championship, Michael Jordan paired with fisherman Gritz Gresham, carding an 18-under par 198 in the Crosby Golf Tournament held near Winston-Salem in North Carolina. And for those that care, the tourney was won by a pair of NFL place kickers who recorded a 39-under par 177, if you don't mind. Three shots behind Jordan and Gresham was a team comprised of North Carolina's Dean Smith, North Carolina State's Jim Valvano, rest in peace to both gentlemen, and the North Carolina Governor, Jim Martin. There's a good tidbit to begin with, mate. Minutia lovers unite. NB87, where tidbits happen. (laughs) The day after the Celtics secured their 16th NBA title, the latest trade rumor surrounding the Bulls involved Kingsguard Larry Drew. In other news, the Denver Nuggets accused the Bulls of tampering with assistant coach Alan Bristow. Make of that what you will. That sounds dubious. After reports, after reports that Doug Collins had spoken to Bristow about joining the Bulls staff, Collins and Bristow were roommates when they both played for the 76ers. This is Manusha Central. We're only two minutes in. <laughs> you can visit us on uh, manusha.com forward slash in all Ennis. <laughs> Actually, no, don't go to that website. It probably doesn't exist. Although I'm now going to have to check. <laughs> I probably will too. On June 15, a draft article in the Tribune had Johnny Dawkins or Kenny Skywalker penned in for the Bulls. Jerry Reinsdorf said they need a point guard and maybe a small forward as he expected Orlando Woolridge to hold out until November or December. Jerry also added that a team in the top four, believed to be the Indiana Pacers, called to offer the number four pick in a trade. It was that the team also wanted either Jordan or Oakley in the deal that called Jerry's Jets. (laughs) Uh, I've missed this series. (laughs) 
In free agent news, Chicago was pursuing the Clippers' Franklin Edwards, who did a great job replacing Norm Nixon the previous year. Jerry Ronsoff said the final choice on the player that the Bulls would take in the draft lies with Jerry Krause. And he then gave a shot to the previous Bulls ownership in saying that if it was an issue like drafting Quinton Daly after having assault charges laid against him, he'd probably step in. <laughs> probably. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> On the 16th of June, Cleveland's second-round draft pick from 1985, John Hot Rod Williams, was cleared finally of the point-shaving allegations that were made against him. He was now free to make his NBA debut after being forced to sit out what would have been his rookie season in 85-86 until that trial had concluded. Now, this is preempting the regular season. However, I want to add that Hot Rod was firing on all cylinders. That's terrible. As his first pro game was a great one. He had 22 points on 8 of 11 shooting, along with 7 boards and 3 assists in the Cavaliers' 113-106 to home win versus Washington. Also, on the eve of this 86 NBA draft, prior to that midnight trade deadline, Philadelphia sent its number one pick to Cleveland in exchange for Roy Hinson, and then in a trade that's still regularly referenced to this day, Philadelphia dealt Moses Malone along with Terry Catledge and the number 21 pick, which would turn out to be UNLV's Anthony Jones, who was a three-season, four-team player, eight games with Chicago, I should add, to start the 89 season. Hashtag NB89. They were sent to Washington for Jeff Ruland. Dare I say, here we go. Friend of the show, episode 45, and Cliff Robinson. Apparently, news of the deals was not made known to the media until the morning of the draft, but that's a, a massive trade that went down at the time. Which do you think had a bigger impact on the NBA? Was it the Roy Hinton for what would be the number one pick in the draft trade or the other Moses trade? Looking back, I think the Moses one is looked upon as like, how could that happen? But at the time, I guess it made sense. Well, obviously it made sense or it wouldn't have been dealt, but uh, people question to this day. And when I did speak to Jeff, name drop central here, <laughs> uh, about that, he was just plagued by injuries, unfortunately, which really derailed any chance he had to show what he actually could offer uh, when he did change cities. So, uh, yeah, I love looking back on this some 30-odd years later, and uh, the what-ifs are quite incredible when you uh, put it into the perspective. 1986 NBA Draft On the 17th, that was the day for the 1986 NBA Draft in New York. The 86 NBA champs, Boston, were unlikely suitors with the number two pick, and that's by virtue of Red Auerbach's 1984 trade. Gerald Henderson went to Seattle. Celtics selected Len Bias from the University of Maryland, and we'll talk about Len in just a moment. We're about 30 seconds into the episode, and we've got two absolutely atrocious trades that took place at around this time. Yeah. it's uh, When you look back on it now, you just think, wow. What was being thought at that time, but in uh, hindsight, of course, it's a wonderful thing, but mm. at the time, these things were making sense. Yeah, exactly. We only know that they were atrocious in hindsight. Again, amazing that the defending NBA champions had the number two pick in the draft. Incredible. Uh, Red Auerbach was a, a mastermind of these sort of deals, which ended up benefiting his franchise uh, much more often than not. Rounding out the top five picks, Golden State Warriors selected North Carolina State's very talented, uh, yet somewhat troubled. Chris Washburn at number three. Auburn University's Chuck Connors Person went at number four to the Indiana Pacers. A couple of quick facts too, mate. Only five persons since Chuck were drafted from Auburn, and at least one, a people person, his younger brother, Wesley. Mm. Another affable person on that list is Chris Morris. And also, the other fact is that the previous person drafted from Auburn is Charles Barkley. <laughs> what a one-two combo of selections out of Auburn, though, when you think about that person and Barkley. And the number five pick went to the New York Knicks, and they selected the aforementioned Kenny Walker from the University of Kentucky. That was a lot of people. <laughs> that was a lot of people. The population of persons was getting out of control there. Entering the draft, it was widely considered that Chicago needed to secure in order of importance a man in the middle, a point guard, and a small forward. And in a nutshell, here's the Bulls' 86 NBA draft. They picked Brad Sellers out of Ohio State at number nine in round one, Larry Kristoviak out of Montana at number 28 in round two, Ricky Wilson from George Mason at 52 for round three, Scott Meats from Illinois at Urbana-Champaign at pick 74, and that was round four selection, uh, Jimmy Gilbert out of Texas A&M at pick 98 in the fifth round. He did not play an NBA game. Pete Myers, that's a name we'll talk a bit about in this mm. NBA 87 series, out of Arkansas Little Rock at pick number 120 out of the sixth round. 
And last but not least, Robert Henderson out of Michigan at pick 144 in the seventh round, and he also did not play an NBA game. A few quick stats of those picks. Brad played 268 games for the Bulls. Pete, 202, 30 of which were in this 87 season. Now, both those tallies included the playoffs. Larry would play 19 games for Chicago in 1995. Dallas selected Georgia Tech's Mark Price with the first pick of round two, and that pick was then traded to Cleveland for a 1989 second rounder, who turned out to be Jeff Hodge, did not play in the NBA. Wow. The Cavaliers' 1987 season in four words, Doherty, Harper, Price, Williams. They also picked Johnny Newman, so Jay New out of the University of... Well, I'm not sure if he actually knew ahead of... Uh, out of the University of Richmond, one of just three players in the college's history, mind you, in the second round of the 86 draft. And a few more Bulls-related transactions were to take place. The selection of Brad Sellers over fan favourite Johnny Dawkins drew a chorus of boos from the 3,100 people gathered for the draft in a downtown hotel in Chicago. That was a really big hotel room. (laughs) MCJD explained what Sellers had done in college to the crowd on hand but was drowned out by the booing. Oh, dear. They also traded three second-round picks, one of which was 1986 selection Larry Kristoviak, to Portland for Steve Buffont Coulter. The <laughs> accompanying article said that what forced the Bulls away from Dawkins was the potential holdout of forward Orlando Woolridge, which led to the drafting of a forward. Orlando's agent Larry Fleischer said not drafting Dawkins was a mistake and that the Bulls underestimate the value of Orlando to other teams around the NBA. On this day, the Bulls also announced the signing to non-guaranteed contracts of Mike Brown, episode 62, and Calvin Duncan, and also added that they were not re-signing Quinton Daly. Very good, mate. I love the shameless promotion from you as well, so thanks for that. Uh, Friend of the show, Mike Brown, hope you're listening. We should add, mate, MCJD. Most listeners probably will understand. JD's Jim Durham, (laughs) the legendary NBA commentator, but particularly fond of his work with the Bulls during the 80s. Brad Sellers and Charles Oakley had played against each other many times in high school, as both were from Cleveland. Oakley called Sellers a skinny old guy, but I'm here, so he's got some protection. (laughs) I'd love to have Charles Oakley on my side. That's a... That's a good thing for Brad. It was later reported in the odds and ends in the Tribune that the Bulls sent no one out to the airport to pick sellers up, who had to ask a local reporter who was there to speak with him for a lift. That's not good. I'm going to put a link in the show notes, mate. There is an article from the Detroit Free Press by Jeanette Howard. Pistons talent can't buy him alone. And check the show notes to find out more. I want to briefly mention to you, mate, a third round pick of this 86 draft, number 61 overall. A man named John Shasky. Does that name sound familiar to you at all? Yeah, definitely. I remember his 1991-92 upper deck trading card when he was a member of the Dallas Mavericks. Very good, mate. That's a great call. Uh, He was selected by the Jazz in 86, but released following the 88 season, having not played a game. His first NBA game would be November 5, 88, as an OG member of the Miami Heat. His last NBA game was April 21, 1991, playing for the Mavericks. This, mate, is a long preamble, basically, to say, uh, hashtag Richard Dosh, because he loved to say that in his podcast, the SI <laughs> Media Podcast. More than four years later, Shasky was part of the Bulls training camp and also played pre-season games with the team before being waived on October 26 of 1995. Wow. Did not know that. That is pretty good. Yep. You also might have seen a tweet I did a few months ago now, which had a photo of number 23, Michael Jordan, passing the ball to Mr. Shasky, wearing the number 45 jersey for the Bulls. Wow, that's a ripper. Yeah, not bad. So I'll include a a link to that tweet in the show notes as well. Incredibly, another 1986 draftee who was initially picked by Atlanta in the 85 NBA draft, that selection was later rescinded by the NBA because of the uncertainty of his true age, (laughs) Arvidas Sabonis. Portland, with their last pick in the first round at number 24, Arvidas would have to wait over nine years before he'd play his first NBA game in November of 1995. Wow. That's another one of those great NBA history what-ifs, mate. No doubt about that. There's a great podcast put out by the Portland Trailblazers. It's called The Trail, surprisingly enough, and it's a two-part episode where they actually talk about Arvidas' journey from... Europe to actually coming across to the USA, and it's an absolute ripper. So check that out as well. It'll be in the show notes. 
Now, on the 19th of June, Len Bias tragically died, just two days removed from the NBA draft. And I'll quickly refer back to episode 15, the season finale of NB86, where we were joined by the great Mike Carey, who was a fantastic guest. He was a Celtics beat writer for the best part of the 1980s. And he talked about that tragic day. Some really good insights shared there. So check that out as well. Episode 15 of NB86. And not quite as significant, but on the following day, June 20, Gene Littles and Johnny Bark were named assistant coaches for the Bulls. Let's jump forward to July the 2nd. The Courier News out of New Jersey printed an article titled Kids Need Help With Drug Fight. The day prior was the final day of Nike's All-American Basketball Camp at Princeton University. The article details how Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley gave lectures about public responsibilities, particularly as role models to the next crop of high school stars. Momentarily, mate, we'll jump ahead three or so weeks to July 25 Chicago Tribune. It briefly reported under the title of A Couple of Couples that Jordan, on board a flight to Hawaii, overshadowed a newly wedded couple's Maui honeymoon. Upon landing, a white Rolls Royce, a red convertible, and a golf cart were parked on the runway. MJ's luggage went into the convertible, Jordan hopped into the Rolls, and the newlyweds got on the golf cart and everybody drove away. How good is that? That's one of the best things i found throughout this research. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so the newlywed couple... They were overshadowed by Jordan, who then hopped into their Rolls Royce on the tarmac, and uh, they hopped into a golf cart instead, and everybody went their own way. So, quite incredible. That is one of the tidbits of all three seasons that we've covered so far. (laughs) Go back to July 16th. Jordan spoke at an event hosted by Coca-Cola at Philadelphia's Adams Mark Hotel. Hmm. So, Jordan was everywhere, it seems, throughout this off-season, and there's plenty more locations he'll be travelling to before we get to the season opener at New York on November 1. After being told that a fracture line remained from his broken foot suffered at the start of the 85-86 season, Michael Jordan was told by doctors to refrain from playing basketball during the offseason. MJ had previously played in an all-star game in Las Vegas, which drew the ire of Bulls management. Jerry Krause commented that Jordan has agreed not to play until training camp and downplayed the fracture line between Jordan and the front office. (laughs) Now, a couple of things here. I looked for, because I had a really quick look throughout our notes to make sure they're all in chronological order, and I saw the words Las Vegas. I then went on a quick search to try and find details of this exhibition game, because I found that fascinating. Couldn't find anything. Secondly, um, Jordan obviously paid no attention whatsoever to the not playing before training camp because there's an absolute ripper of an exhibition game that he was part of at North Carolina that we'll get to in a little while. On July 17, MJ was in Chicago to shoot around with teammates at the multiplex as Tex Winter conducted an off-season camp for the Bulls forwards and centers. Jordan also flew down to Phoenix to spend two days getting to know new coach Doug Collins, which I'll expand on in just a little while. New draft pick Brad Sellers was to miss the Bulls' rookie camp during contract negotiations. His agent was open in saying Sellers would be signed by the Bulls before training camp starts on October 3rd. Good how you mentioned that Jordan also caught up with Doug Collins for a couple of days. Yeah. And this must have been just days before Jordan then jettisoned off to Hawaii. So all kinds of things happening throughout July here for Michael Jeffrey Jordan. On July 20, with only Mike Smirk and Dave Corzine on hand to play centre, and last year's starter, Joanne Oldham, unlikely to return, Jerry Krause was in the mood for talking up rookie Mike Brown by calling him, and I quote, a Wes Unseld type centre, end quote. Wow. I mean, they had similar builds. That's the first comparison you'd make between them, but that's a big call. Doug Collins pumped the brakes a bit by saying he was fourth in line behind the aforementioned guys, <laughs> wasn't a great leaper, and would struggle against taller centers like Kareem. <laughs> That's pumping the brakes and then some. Mike Smrek then broke a bone in his foot, as reported on July 22nd, keeping him out for eight weeks, which I guess would move Mike Brown into third in line. Yeah, a very serviceable player and, of course, a decade-plus NBA veteran. And former friend of the show, so I've got to keep (laughs) buttering his toast or whatever the saying is. Buttering his toast, that's a new one. I've never heard that before. On July 21st, the SAC wrote a nice piece on Bulls rookie camp tryout Calvin Duncan, who came over from Cleveland in the trade with Charles Oakley the season before. 
Duncan knocked back a veterans camp invite the year before to play basketball with Athletes in Action, a group who spread the Christian word around the country whilst playing basketball. Duncan played in the Summer League for the Bulls in 1986 alongside Mike Brown and Air Petey, Pete Myers. Air Petey, nice. In the first game of the Bulls' 93-94 season, the first game that Pete Myers replaced MJ as the starting two-guard for the Bulls, Doug Collins, who was calling the game for TNT with Bob Neal, called Pete Myers Air Petey. There you go, mate. That's more minutia. I don't actually recall that, so yeah. well done on that one. And Pete Myers had a big impact in that game. On July 25, Bucks coach Don Nelson and an official of the team went ahead with legal action against American Airlines after Nelson and Mike Dunleavy, senior, were injured in a runway incident that we covered back in NB85, Adam. Yeah, I do recall that. Got to say quickly, I really enjoyed the research for this episode where we're covering the whole off-season and then leading into the pre-season before the regular season. Thought it was fantastic, so much great stuff and almost enough for a two-parter. The Bulls lost to Indiana 118-111 to in their Summer League game in Canada's southernmost city, Windsor. And you can now go to Windsor's Wikipedia page and find some updated information <laughs> stating this game. That's fantastic. And I did actually see that subsequently. I think you mentioned at the time you made the edit. I went and then checked it out pretty quickly. It's uh, another little wrinkle to add. Love it. When a, a town like Windsor hosts NBA Summer League games, I, I think it uh, deserves to be mentioned at least on their wiki page, Adam. I agree with that 100%, mate. I've also got one reference to a Summer League game as well that the Bulls played, and I'll get to that shortly. Sweet. Mike Brown led the Bulls with 23 points, and Calvin, don't call me Tim Duncan, had 22. <laughs> nice work on the fly there. I like that. As we move into the month of August, August 1st, former Bulls head coach Stan Albeck was first linked with his alma mater, Bradley University, and the vacant head coaching position there. He would officially take the job on a five-year deal on August 25th and said he was done coaching in the NBA. How quickly things move on, eh? Doesn't seem like too long ago we're referencing Stan every episode throughout NBA 86, and just like that, he's, he's gone and all of a sudden moving on to completely different career goals. So there you go. On August the 3rd, courtesy of the Arizona Republic, I learned that the Bulls, with Doug Collins at the helm, were in Westchester, taking part in the Southern California Summer Pro League at Loyola Marymount University. Names on the Bulls team included Johnny Paxson and Steve Coulter. How cool is that? Summer League game in Westchester. Just random stuff. And I wouldn't have actually thought that Johnny Pax or even Coulter, because they're yeah. not rookies by any stretch of the imagination, would be playing in a Summer League team for the Bulls. But, of course, there they are. Here they are. Yep. On the 5th of August, Michael Holson, good friend of the show, uh, episode 72, became a veteran free agent and signed an offer sheet with Portland. And have a listen to episode 72. Had some good stories to share, actually, Mike, Mike Holton. Yes. On August 6th, Orlando Woolridge and his wife welcomed their first child, Zachary, who weighed in at 9 pound 9 and an impressive 22.5 inches, which was apparently half of Orlando's vertical leap. <laughs> Clever. Yeah, that's a big baby. It's a whopper. Hello to Glenn Davis, if you're listening. 9 pound 9 <laughs> uh, <laughs> On the same date, Michael Jordan participated in what the Philadelphia Daily News said was his sixth of a would-be eight Pro-Am golf appearances of the summer prior to the Bulls' fall camp, this time at High Point in North Carolina. And for what it's worth, MJ rocked a Carolina blue golf shirt and cap with white pants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Jordan quote from the Green Bay Press Gazette, quote, Hopefully, in 10 years, I can achieve all the things I want to achieve, a world championship, <laughs> maybe an MVP of the league, end quote. Good stuff there from Jordan. Keeping the bar low, Michael. How much stuff was he doing in this off-season? It's quite incredible. Yeah, it was busy. On the 9th and 10th of August, Jordan was to run an exclusive basketball clinic for 20 junior players at Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. Of the 13 who had signed up, a few subsequently withdrew, for reasons unknown, and the camp was ultimately cancelled. <laughs> what are people doing? That's crazy. <laughs> Another great tidbit. Kmart's second podcast review on iTunes adds this short but sweet gem and it's appropriately titled He's Back. Now this was in reference to Jordan's triumphant return to the Chicago Stadium floor as we detailed in NB86-12. And the review reads, 
Great intro from the last show. MJ is back in time for the stretch drive. Question, when will you guys start on 86, 87? Well, that's now been answered with this episode, Curtis. I'm really pleased that you're uh, excited to hear this next part of the series and uh, hope you enjoy this. And thanks again for your continued support. August 23rd, the Tribune reported that the Bulls sent Sydney Green to Detroit for El Curitan and a 1987 second round pick. Charles Oakley's performance in his rookie season chased Green out of town, wrote Bob Sakamoto. Curitan then spoke in the third person in saying if the Bulls traded Sid Green to get him, the Bulls must have thought highly of El Curitan. <laughs> the sack said Green would battle Mahorn and rookie John Sally for a starting spot in Detroit. Sid ended up starting 69 of 80 games for the Pistons the following season. Since taking over, only four players remained from Jerry Krause's first day with the Bulls and two of those, Oldham and Woolridge, were currently free agents. Mm, these are great statistics, mate. On the 27th, the Bulls ended up waving Calvin Duncan and on the 28th, the Detroit Free Press printed an article titled The Wizard of Weber, the movie. Follow the NB87 Twitter hashtag and find more details about that. Basically, MJ was being considered to play a role in a movie more than 10 years before Space Jam even arrived at cinemas. Hmm. I've got a photo as well to accompany the article, so it's worth having a look at. Just in general as well, mate, it's actually worth checking out these hashtags of NB87 because things that we don't mention on the episodes here still do get referenced via Twitter. Yes, we hope to see MP87 trending on Twitter at some point in time in the near future. <laughs> uh, on August 29, Bob Sakamoto reported that the Bulls free agent forward Orlando Woolridge was awaiting a free agent offer sheet from the New Jersey Nets. It was also reported that Jerry Krause said he would match any offer sheet for Orlando despite the general consensus that they would let O go in an exchange for a first round pick. Apparently, a Chicago-New Jersey-Orlando deal was close before the NBA draft. The Bulls would have received two first-rounders, but Woolridge wanted to test the free agent market, putting that proposed deal to an end. Now, also on this day, mate, the Arizona Daily Star printed a story about Jordan's involvement in an anti-drug campaign headed by former and future NBA player John Lucas, along with the New Jersey Nets, Buck Williams and Duke All-American slash San Antonio Spur draft choice. Johnny Dawkins. They were there to visit schools in the state of Tennessee before conducting a clinic on September 9 to be held at the University of Tennessee. <laughs> and August 31st, Bob Sakamoto reported that small forward Gene Banks was to sign a four-year deal with two guaranteed, with the Bulls for around $400,000 per season. Hashtag maximum security. <laughs> <laughs> on September 3rd, Bob Sakamoto reported that the Bulls signed free agent forward Mike Gibbo Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> I'll quickly stop you there. So Australian listeners will probably know who Mike Gibson was. Uh, he was a great sports personality, broadcaster, very well loved and uh, a parochial Aussie, I guess you'd say. A legend in Australian sports reporting, sports journalism. Rest in peace, Twitter Gibbo as well. Sadly passed away, I think, in the last 12 to 18 months. Um, so he's got a namesake who signed as a free agent with the Bulls. I'm not sure that this Mike Gibson's nickname was actually Gibbo, but the Bulls <laughs> were also still to finalise the deal with Robin Banks, who would eventually sign on September 9. The delay was that <laughs> Banks actually wanted a third year guaranteed on the deal. Mike Gibson's contract was later waived on October 27, so as quickly as he arrived, Gibbo was out the door. Also, several teams were showing interest in Bulls guards John Paxson and Kyle Macy. Uh, one of those names certainly wouldn't be with the team come opening night. Yeah, Gibson was unlucky there. He got waived on the 27th of October, so he was on the roster through the preseason, and in the three or four days prior to the regular season tipping off, got the lemon and sauce, so no good. Now, on the 5th of September, the Pistons' Joe Dumas, the Hawks' Spud Webb, and Chicago Bulls' Michael Jordan conducted a basketball clinic at Wayne State University for 200 Detroit-area youths aged 12 to 17. The Detroit Free Press article was cleverly titled, Clinic is Pro-Basketball and Anti-Drugs. So I thought that was worth sharing. On the 6th of September, the Carolina Pro-Alumni All-Star Game took place 
Now, this is one of those things that I only found out about in the lead-up to this series being recorded, mate. So this was fantastic stuff. It marked the official opening of the $34 million Dean Smith Center. Wow. And tickets were just $5 each. Uh, teams featured a who's who of UNC basketball history. The white team were led by Jordan, and they defeated blue, led by James Worthy, 111 to 86. And there was also a halftime ceremony where six former Tar Heels, including Michael Jordan, James Worthy, and Phil Ford, had their UNC jerseys retired by virtue of each being named the National Players of the Year. Very cool. Using the Twitter hashtag NB87, you'll see a great photo that was taken from that event, uh, a really cool photo of Jordan. Now, moving along, mate, September 9, Michael Jordan, along with New Jersey Nets' Buck Williams and Houston Rockets' John Lucas, toured 12 Knoxville, Tennessee schools in an effort to warn students about the dangers of drugs and alcohol. Jordan, referring to Len Bias' death, said, quote, very tragic, very sad, end quote, noting that dreams and talent all, quote, ended in one big mistake, end quote. Later that day, the San Antonio Spurs new draft pick, Johnny Dawkins, joined the players at a youth basketball tournament. And for those keeping count, John Lucas would go on to sign as a free agent with Milwaukee in January of 1987. On October 15, during the NBA's annual league meeting in Orlando, it was reported that the fate of Chicago's Orlando wouldn't be determined for another two weeks. It was also reported that Nets owner Alan Orfzein, has that pronunciation going, do you think? <laughs> Alan Orfzein. Old Orfzein. Had been told by Jerry Reinsdorf that the Bulls didn't want Woolridge to return for the following season. When the Nets contacted Jerry Krause about acquiring Woolridge, they were told for the Bulls to release his rights, New Jersey would need to give them Mike Jeminski, Daryl Dawkins, or Buck Williams. Wow. The following day, the Tribune reported the Bulls had agreed to send guard Kyle Style Macy to the Indiana Pacers for two second-round picks. Two names dropped to replace Macy in the Bulls' backcourt were Eric Sleepy Floyd and... Jim, don't call me John Paxson. The <laughs> trade was made official for Macy the following day. The negotiations between the Bulls and first-round pick Brad Sellers were coming along slowly, with Team Sellers rejecting the Bulls' latest offer. Brad Sellers was after a four-year, $2 million contract, with the Bulls countering with $1.4 million. As late as three days before training camp, the two sides were yet to settle on a contract. On September 24, on being told that the Knicks were interested in giving free agent Juwan Oldham an offer sheet, Jerry Krause gave his usual answer that the Bulls will match any offer sheet given to their free agents and then sung the praises of Oldham and what he offers the Bulls. Yeah, this was a really interesting little uh, negotiation between Oldham and the Bulls and prospective other teams as well that I've read about quite a bit throughout the uh, research for this episode too. A trend that I was picking up during this period was that Krauss and the Bulls wanted to match any of these offer sheets that were given to their free agents so they could retain their rights to try to use them as uh, as trade bait. That's the, the vibe that I was getting. Yep. The SAC wrote that the Bulls appeared to be more concerned with their future than the present in being willing to have a poor season and collect a bounty of draft picks from other teams who signed their free agents. Woolridge would eventually be dealt for a first rounder and two seconds. The first rounder would become the sixth overall pick used on Stacey King and Oldham was traded to New York for a first rounder that eventually became Olden Polonese. Nice. Didn't actually know that. There you go. The Knicks acquired a first rounder to give to the Bulls by sending Daryl Walker to the Denver Nuggets to get the pick. As I said before, Jerry Krause was actually doing a great job in gathering draft picks to help build for the future. Indeed, indeed. I guess we should also elaborate on the Olden Polonese selection as well, shouldn't we? As you did mention there, mate, Olden Polonese is one of those names floated. And, of course, on 1987 draft day, the Seattle Supersonics and the Chicago Bulls orchestrated a deal which switched Polonese to the Sonics in return for the Sonics sending their pick to the Chicago Bulls. That would have long-running ramifications in terms of NBA history, and of course, Pippen is now one of the top 50 players of all time, uh, as per that 1997 top 50 announcement. Agreed. Now, September closed out with the LA Lakers' Mitch Kupchak retiring as a player, 
to complete his master's degree at UCLA before becoming LA's assistant general manager. NB87, where NBA minutia happens. Minutia are plenty. On October 2nd, Hello, Brad Sellers. Goodbye, Orlando Woolridge, said uh, the sack as the Bulls' first round pick signed on the dotted line on October 1st. Woolridge's agent Larry Fleischer expected the deal to be finalised in time for O to be in training camp for New Jersey. It was then reported a day later that the deal had been finalised. We probably should clarify for new listeners to the show who the sack is. We we're talking about the great Bob Sakamoto, who has been a mainstay of the NB franchise since NB85 and uh, continues to be as we enter into NB87, mate. Thank you for elaborating on that. I was getting a little bit too comfortable with my surroundings, wasn't I? (laughs) Also on October 2nd, Bob Verdi wrote a piece on Air Jordan being ready for takeoff this season. Recent rain had forced MJ to put his golf clubs away in readiness for the upcoming season. Jordan added he wanted to skip the preseason and get straight to the important stuff. And with three coaches in three years, the team needed to settle down and get some stability for the future. Jordan had just completed a litany of tests at the multiplex, including one that showed his body fat sat at just 3.29%, or roughly the same amount that a guy sitting at a desk all day has in his left earlobe. (laughs) A scientific study, is it? Verdi then spoke of the Krauss-like conditions that new coach Doug Collins placed on MJ's off-season not long after he had been hired. This must have went down well after Krauss had upset Jordan the previous season with his telling Jordan what to do with his broken foot after not having spent any time getting to know him. Jordan, as I mentioned earlier on, then spent some time with Collins in Arizona during this off-season to ensure a bad taste wasn't left in his mouth yet again. Already in this article, a comparison to Cubs great Ernie Banks came up, suggesting that Jordan may have a career in Chicago that might come up short of the ultimate success. Fascinating to see this sort of stuff, knowing, of course, what would unfold in the subsequent five to ten years. Chicago Bulls, 1986-87, training camp. On October 3rd, the Bulls commenced a brief preseason training camp at the Deerfield Multiplex. It was also reported that Juwan Oldham failed to show for a physical and was to be fined by the Bulls. Oldham expressed exactly how he felt in saying that he trusted no aspect of the Chicago Bulls franchise. Good to have confidence in your team heading into a new campaign and failing to show up for a physical. So, yeah, not great signs. And it was only going to get worse for Juwan as well. Mm, I did read that, yes. On October 4, veteran free agent Alston Turner signed with the Bulls. The Nuggets received a 1988 second-round draft choice from Chicago to ink that deal, and that pick would be Todd Mitchell, who played a total of 24 NBA games, none of which were as a Denver Nugget. Alston would play 73 games with the Bulls in this coming season, so that's a name you'll be hearing a bit of as we get through this run of episodes. I really enjoy hearing about these guys that I've never heard of before, like a Todd Mitchell and the fact that he actually played 24 NBA games, none of which with the team who drafted him. That's what I love, mate. And mm. I know that you do this as well, but when I do say these certain names, I head straight to the, the Mecca, basketballreference.com, check out what these guys did or, or didn't do in some instances and what success they may have had or may not have had. And then we sprinkle that in beautifully, I must say. Shameless self-promotion there. To elaborate a bit further on what, what has happened over the previous years. No one does it better. <laughs> As reported on October 4, in the Bulls' first intra-team scrimmage, a lineup of Jordan, Paxson, Curitan, Sellers and Corzine easily accounted for Coulter, Ricky Wilson, Riverbanks, Charles Oakley and Mike Smrek. On the 5th of October, news broke that Chicago would play host to the NBA's All-Star Game in February of 1988. That's cool. I thought that was quite newsworthy and I see you smiling already, mate, as you heard that. Hmm. We did an episode all about the 88 All-Star Game, episode 38 of In All Earnest. Great recap of the 1988 All-Star Game, even if I do say so myself. Great recall, too, on the episode number, too, I must say. It's because the 88 All-Star Game was the 38th annual, and it just happened to be episode 38. (laughs) Bit of minutia there for the fans of the show. Wow. All three of you. Just when I thought it couldn't get any better. No, that's right. 
On the 8th, the Bulls would make a one-night return to the scene of their 85-86 training camp at Beloit College in Wisconsin. An intra-squad pre-season game between Doug Collins' red team with MJ and Tex Winters' whites. And I'm not talking about Tex Winters' underwear. <laughs> the score of that game, 92-80 to 80 in favour of Jordan's team. In this Bulls first public appearance at Beloit College, John Paxson showed off his new outside jumper with 18 points. MJ had 30 and Brad Sellers had the dunk of the night on a very sweet lob from new recruit Earl Curitan. Nice. According to the Daily Herald's Jim O'Donnell, Brad Sellers contributed a, quote, strikingly mobile 25 points for the winners, end quote. Oak had 21 points for the Whites and Dave Corzine 19 points. Again, Jim O'Donnell, quote, Rookie long shot Pete Myers finished with 10 points for the winners and played a defensive game that Collins later called reminiscent of perennial All-NBA defender Michael Cooper, hmm. end quote. Yeah, that's a, a very cool comparison. Both had a similar body type, you say. And more defensive-minded than offensive too. Absolutely. October 9, Bob Sakamoto reported that the critics of the skinny Brad Sellers were starting to lighten up. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Coach Collins described the seven-foot sellers as a finesse forward and was very happy with the rookie forward's progress in training camp. Potential starter at the small forward position, Gene Banks, was giving sellers all the old tricks in the book in practice whilst teaching Brad about life in the NBA. Assistant coach John Bark said Sellers has interesting potential in that he can handle the ball like an off-guard, shoot from the perimeter, and has great reach for tipping and blocking shots. There are hopes around the Bulls that he can evolve into a player like Utah's Thel Bailey. That's a fair comparison too, talking about what Sellers could deliver in seasons to come. So, yeah, quite like that. Chicago Bulls, 1986-87, preseason games. On the 10th of October, Chicago kicked off its NBA preseason with a game at the Great Western Forum versus the LA Lakers. LA cruised to a 123-104 to win. Talk of the botched Bulls-Lakers Oldham trade was in the air pre-game and Lakers GM Jerry West said he still hoped to get a deal done. In the game, the Bulls started very well with a strong first quarter and 13 points from Jordan, including two lob dunks of passes from Steve Buffont Coulter. They <laughs> trailed 57-49 to at the half with good contributions from Jordan Oakley and rookie Brad Sellers. Aside from Jordan's 44 points on 14 for 20 shooting and 16 for 18 from the line, there wasn't a consistent threat for the Bulls. When Jordan picked up a fourth foul midway through the third term, the Lakers went on a 20 to 9 run to break it open. How's that for a stat line for Jordan? Just quietly in his first preseason game. Uh, 44 points, 14 to 20 from the field and uh, 16 of 18 from the line. So thanks for coming. <laughs> That information there was from a article that you read on the 11th. The Bulls at Portland later that night were thumped 113 to 89. Kiki Vandeweghe top scored for the Blazers with 21 points. Jordan had 20, including 10 of 11 from the free throw line. And Chicago were 0 and 2 in the preseason. Bob Sakamoto had the Bulls articles flowing like a river banks in pointing out some positives among the two losses over the weekend for Chicago. Uh. They were that Charles Oakley had unveiled a good shooting touch from the outside. Jordan is healthy and better than ever after 44 in the exhibition opener, and rookie Sellers was off to a better than expected start. Then came the negatives. The Bulls need to learn their plays. Coach Collins was annoyed after the team failed to execute versus the Lakers and then showed a lack of interest in practice before the Blazers game. The Bulls also need more scoring. Oakley's ability to hit a perimeter shot is vital to their scoring depth this season. The Bulls lack depth and the team needs more outside shooting, starting with Paxson and Coulter asserting themselves more with increased shot attempts. Doug Collins said he expected some sloppiness with a number of new players and a new set of plays for the team to learn. On October 14, Doug Collins criticised his team for not knowing the playbook properly after the Bulls lost to the Lakers and it appeared they still weren't paying attention after dropping their second exhibition game in Portland in front of a capacity crowd. The Bulls' five first-half assists showed the one-on-one -on -one style of play in the first two quarters leading to a 57-43 deficit. Before the game, Dave Corzine was selected team captain over Jordan, 
with Gene Banks, the team players rep, and Paxson, assistant player rep. Wow. Okay, that's cool. I had no idea that was the case. And I'm very pleased to see that Dave Corzine was given team captain. Hashtag Dave Love. Indeed. A few days later, the SAC wrote a piece on Steve Coulter's return to Portland and the affection that Blazers fans had for him. Coulter was described as the nicest guy I know by Jim Paxson, and he did a lot of work in the community in his time in Portland. So much so that the Blazers gave him a $7,500 bonus at season's end, which he then donated, along with $2,500 of his own money to his church in Phoenix. That's cool because I read about that when I was doing a bit of research on Coulter a couple of weeks ago now, found a few good photos of him and have attempted to get in touch with him to have him on the show. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, I did read that where he donated his bonus. Uh, So that was good stuff there. Obviously a great guy. He was a selfless player in Portland in getting the ball to the likes of Vanderway and Drexler, but Bulls coach Collins wants him to be more selfish in getting his scoring average into double figures in 86-87. The following day, October 15, Warriors centre Joe Barry Carroll was officially put on the trade block and the Bulls were reportedly interested, said Bob Sakamoto. A deal could possibly include Oldham, who Warriors coach George Carl was familiar with from the CBA, despite the two not getting along very well. Furious George. There were also reports that the Bulls were interested in Kings Ford and friend of the show Eddie Johnson, who is after a five-year deal at $700,000 per season. That's very interesting. I have to reach out to Eddie again and ask him a bit more about that and any subsequent follow-up I get, I'll include by the NB87 hashtag on Twitter. The following day reported just how on board Jordan and Collins were to bring both JB Carroll and Eddie Johnson to the Bulls. Oldham and two first-rounders were the expected costs to sign Carroll and a first-rounder would secure Johnson. The two would help fill two gaping holes for the Bulls at centre and small forward. Hello to Brad Sellers if you're listening. (laughs) Sources said, Kraus may have made a mistake in securing banks and sellers to their respective contracts instead of a contract like Eddie Johnson's. Joe Klein's name was also bandied about in a proposed deal between the two teams, that being Sacramento and Chicago. Joe Klein's name gets linked to the Bulls a good 10 years before he actually would be on the roster of Chicago. The third podcast review we'll mention is from another big-time fan of the show, Aaron. And it's not you, Aaron. Another Aaron, (laughs) a.k.a. Azamalo on Twitter. So A-double-Z-A-M-A-double-L-O-W. From what I understand, through our correspondence back and forth, he grew up here in Australia and loved watching the 1990s NBA and Australia's NBL. And his review is titled, put simply, the best. (laughs) I'm not making that up. Uh, It reads... I've been listening to these guys for a long time now. Their knowledge of the history of the NBA and interviews with ex-NBA players make this one of my favorites. Do yourself a favor and get onto this one. Thanks, guys. Wow. So another stellar effort there. Thanks, Aaron. Not you, Aaron, but anyhow. Always really good to hear these reviews from people. And again, it just amazes me that people listen to it. (laughs) It's crazy, isn't it? But it's so good. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised how much uh, enthusiasm one can gain just by getting some of these reviews. So they're definitely welcomed. Yeah. Now, as we speak, there's currently two more reviews of the podcast that I'll save for a future In All Airness episode, uh, one of them from Australia and another from Brazil. So that was pretty cool. And I'll read those out at a future date. The NBA visited Iowa's Carver Hawkeye Arena on the 15th as the Bulls took on the Utah Jazz featuring Hawkeye great and future bull Bobby Hansen. The Hawkeyes scrimmaged in front of the crowd at 6.30pm and Des Moines game tipped off at 8pm. Now that's a pretty funny joke if you're good with your US geography. The Bulls had their first preseason win, a 97-85 to win against Utah, led by Jordan's 39 points. It's good to see MJ was in full regular season mode in the exhibitions with a 44-39 and point game so far. He's doing very well offensively. Chicago's record was 1-2 and after that victory. Now on the 17th, the Bulls hosted the Lakers but lost 109-99 to and dropped to 1-3 and in the preseason. Worthy led the 3-0 and Lakers with 24 points. Jordan dropped 20 for the Bulls and Dave Corzine had 16. On the 18th, the Lakers and Bulls squared off again, this time at Chapel Hill's Dean Smith Student Activities Centre, which was actually referred to as the SAC. SAC, no joke. Hmm. 
According to the Daily Tar Heel, general public tickets were $12. And in a special pre-game tip of the hat, James Worthy and Michael Jordan were given a joint introduction in front of their adoring UNC-based fans. Hmm. The Lakers won convincingly 123-101, to and Chicago's record was a paltry 1-4. and Both James Worthy and Wes Matthews agree that the Bulls could use Joe Barry Carroll. A former Bull, Wes Matthews, said they could also use a guy like James Worthy, who scored 24 points in just 23 minutes. The Bulls led 53-50 to at the half, but a strong Laker second half, including a 9-0 run late in the fourth, was too much for the pesky Bulls. Jordan had 20 and 9 boards, causing 16 and 7 rebounds, and Oakley a double-double with 13 and 12. Rookie Sellers received the baptism of fire, according to Doug Collins, as Worthy put 16 points on him in the first quarter alone. After 21 in the first half minutes for Jordan, Collins only played him 12 in the second half. Jordan also played some small forward, with Gene Banks suffering from a bruised right foot. Mm, and that later became something even more worrying for the Bulls too. On October 20, Bob Sakamoto reported that the Bucks approached the Bulls for a trade of small forwards. Gene Banks for Kenny Fields. Okay, didn't know about that. There were some in the NBA that believed Fields could be a... 20 point per game scorer, despite Bucks coach Don Nelson saying he wasn't much of an offensive player. <laughs> and the Bulls needed help in that area as they could open up the NBA season with the league's worst offense. Wow, wrote Bob Sakamoto. Mm. There was still hope of a deal to acquire Joe B. Carroll, who would help offensively. A newly acquired Steve Coulter was only averaging five points per game on seven for 35 shooting in the preseason. Okay, not ideal. Um, I wasn't aware of this much interest in Joe Barry Carroll, so good to be filled in on this as the 86-87 season approached. A stat appeared the following day on October 21 that made me feel like Oldham just didn't want to be in Chicago. He had been fined seven times in 18 days for various infractions, such as being late for practice and was distancing himself from the team. Add to this, Gene Banks thinks he may have broken his foot and the Bulls had issues to deal with right before the start of the season. Coach Collins said that Juwan wasn't willing to meet him halfway in resolving his unhappiness about the dissolved trade to the Lakers, so he was taking a hard-line stance with his sulking centre. Doug was making Oldham sit outside the glass in case practice caught by himself and train. If you won't practice with the team, you're on your own. Wow. Okay, so yeah, things were starting to deteriorate rather quickly in terms of Oldham's position on the team. Also on this date, the Daily Herald reported that the NBA's Board of Governors agreed to expand the league by one to three teams, no earlier than the 88-89 season. The vote was a unanimous 23-0. and zero. Wow, that's cool. The previous team to enter the NBA via expansion was the 1980 Dallas Mavericks. On October 22nd, the Trib reported that Gene Banks was due out for six to seven weeks with a hairline fracture in his right foot. Wow. River said he had prepared himself for the worst case scenario and he was now going to commit his time to getting rookie bread sellers ready for the season. Sellers had encountered and had been burned by James Worthy and Kiki Vanderway and now had back to back preseason appointments against Dominic Wilkins. Jerry Krauss now turned his efforts to replacing Banks as the Bulls were already thin at the small four position with Robin available to play. On October 23rd, Jerry Krauss had until the following day to make a decision on trading for Joe Barry Carroll. Krauss had felt to this point that the asking price of Oldham and two first-rounders was too high. It was reported that Krauss would wait out the result of a proposed trade that would send Eddie Johnson to Cleveland as to if he would sign either of Johnson or Carroll. The Bulls, however, did sign Alfred Rick Hughes to a non-guaranteed contract. Hughes was told by Kraus that if certain moves took place, that he, and I quote, would be out of here quick, end quote. Hughes, a Chicago native, featured in a piece by Bob Sakamoto on October 27. He detailed his path from Loyola University of Chicago to becoming the 14th pick in the 1985 draft by San Antonio, to now trying to keep his NBA career alive in his home city. And it should also be noted, mate, uh, Frederick Hughes at the time was the NCAA's fifth highest scorer of all time. And his name was listed throughout countless articles that I've read, and I'm sure that you've looked at as well, in our research for NBA 85, 86, and now 87. 
Also on this day, October 23rd, former Bull George Gervin signed a deal to play in Italy and Mount St. Albeck teed off on the Bulls one last time in an article in the Tribune titled Albeck Rips NBA and Bulls Management. Wow. And we'll have a link to this article in the show notes. Still on the same day, the 23rd, in Nashville, Tennessee, Vanderbilt's Memorial Coliseum hosted the Chicago Bulls and Atlanta Hawks. Again, the Bulls dropped the game and fell to 1-5 and five in the preseason. The following day, the 24th of October, the Bulls made their trade for a centre, but it wasn't J.B. Carroll. Granville Waiters was acquired for a fourth-round pick from the Houston Rockets. However, Krauss was still waiting out a possible breakdown of a move between Sacramento and Cleveland, which would leave the Bulls with a shot to still sign Carroll or Eddie Johnson. Granville Waiters was with the team in time for their 122-112 to loss to Atlanta at Vanderbilt. Jordan had 29 points and Charles Oakley 22 and 14 rebounds. Dominique led the Hawks with 36. Yeah, Dominique Wilson, there you go. Hmm. Travelling to Richmond, Virginia, the Bulls returned to the winner's circle with a repeat matchup against the Hawks in what reads as a very entertaining game. In the second of the back-to-back versus Atlanta, MJ got mad and the Hawks paid the price, wrote Bob Sakamoto, angered by some physical play from Scott Hastings. Jordan responded with 43 points in the Bulls' 124-115 win in Richmond. Jordan said Hastings cleared him out on a pick at one point, and then Hastings stripped the ball from Jordan, which then bounced and hit MJ in the face. (laughs) Hastings said Jordan then punched him in the mouth in response. Wow, okay. (laughs) The incident sparked a 15-2 Bulls run and a 3.3 quarter time lead. The Bulls got great contributions from the whole team with 18 and 11 from Sellers, 12 from Paxson and 13 from Mike Brown. I'd love to recount that recap there to Hastings and see what his memories are of (laughs) being punched in the face from MJ. Thanks for coming. Chicago's record was now a 2 and 5. Scott could have also given Will Perdue and or Steve Kerr a call too, just to exchange notes. Exchange stories, that's true. A new name popped up as a potential addition for the Bulls, Old Mother Hubbard. Wow, Phil Hubbard gets a, well, possibly gets a Guernsey. Elson Turner and Mike Smrek were reported to be on their way out of Chicago and the J.B. Carroll talk was officially pronounced D-O-A, wrote the sack. <laughs> Oh, there's a Turner event. Yeah. <laughs> um, the jokes don't get any better, mate, as the series goes on into the subsequent seasons. Turner ended up playing 70-plus games in his 87 seasons, reportedly on his way out of town, yeah. uh, yet was a mainstay throughout this 87 campaign. On the 26th, now I'm going to butcher his name, but Norm Frauenheim's comprehensive division-by-division division breakdown was printed in the Arizona Republic ahead of the NBA's 86-87 season. Now, how's this tidbit? <laughs> His Midwest Division preview. He says, quote, biggest bust, jazz coach Frank Layden's diet, end quote. <laughs> Crazy stuff. That's just, I mean, I'm taking away from the overall sensational recap it was, and it provided me uh, much insight, but of course, some great laughs based on that one there about Frank Layden. And pardon the pun, but that's just low-hanging fruit, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but it never gets old. Uh that's funny stuff. Now, the Bulls' preseason came to a close on the 26th following a 111-103 win at the Genesis Convention Center in Gary, Indiana versus the Pacers. Wow. Jordan led all scorers with 31 points in 31 minutes and Wayman Tisdale, rest in peace, paced Indiana with 17 points. Chuck Person added 14 and following the win, Doug Collins, addressing his players, said, quote, don't get full of yourselves. We go into New York, referring to this regular season opener at Madison Square Garden, at zero zero, and I don't want to hear that stuff. Mm. Doug was trying to talk the team down, who had just gone three and five in the preseason. Not a whole lot of talking down to happen. A bemusing three and five at the time. I guess he was just trying to settle their expectations of what could be. Chicago's preseason record overall was three and five, and interestingly, Chicago played the Lakers three times and the Hawks twice during this preseason. I'm not sure exactly what the reason behind that was, but another little tidbit for the minutia lovers. On October 28, by jeez, by jingo, by crikey, the Bulls <laughs> waved guards Ricky Wilson and forward Mike Gibson. Oh, that's great. I'm going to cut you off for a minute there. Um, <laughs> Australian listeners will know 
that was the aforementioned Mike Gibson of Australia. Uh, that was his favourite saying, which was absolutely fantastic. And there's probably some clips on YouTube, and if I find one, I'll include it in the notes to this episode. In the briefs section, there was an article titled Players Throw in Towel, Crowd Supplies the Rest. Oh, jeez. Had to read that a poor showing in their first head-to-head in Italy provided Bob McAdoo and George Gervin a taste of basketball in Europe. <laughs> Upset with either a bad call or the pair's subpar play, the fans started pelting the court with coins and other debris. <laughs> the players took refuge in their glass-encased benches. Oh, wow. Then the game was suspended and the players left the court in a glass encased runway <laughs> back to the locker rooms. The Iceman said he was scared for his life. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. I mean, European fans have long been known to be incredible supporters of their teams and I guess they can flip equally as quickly on players who don't live up to their expectations. It's pretty funny that the basketball benches had ice hockey type glass cases around them to protect the players from the fans. Incredible, incredible. October 29 was Bob Sakamoto NBA preview day in the Chicago Tribune. The sack said that Doug Collins had been handed Michael Jordan, Charles Oakley, and a bunch of backups. Whew. Good luck. Jordan could average 35 points per game, and it probably still wouldn't keep them out of the lottery, said the sack. Oh, well, he's not far off on the points per game. I think Jordan got about 37.1 or something points per game in this 87 season, so... During the exhibition season, MJ averaged 33 points per game, whilst the Bulls as a team only just over 100 points per game, pointing out the offensive help that Jordan desperately needs. People inside the organisation questioned if MJ could handle the responsibility he was about to take on and would end up with an injury or burnout. Coach Collins said his goal is to finish above 500, which would get them into the playoffs. That's fair. It was reported on October 30 that Doug Collins and Jerry Krause worked late into the night of October 29 to attempt to trade Joanne Oldham, including possible trades with New York and Portland. The talk surrounding scoring help popped up again in the Sachs article, with any draft pick acquired in a deal for Oldham to be used for the aforementioned scoring help. On scoring help for MJ, Bob detailed Charles Oakley's much-improved jump shot again, saying the Oak shot 300-plus jumpers four days a week during the off-season. Good stuff there from Oak. Newly acquired Granville Waiters is expected to start at centre for the season opener in two days' time. Coach Collins wants to use Dave Corzine off the bench. Mm. And on the eve of the season, Jawan Oldham was officially traded to the New York Knicks for a future first-round draft pick and considerations. The Bulls now had three first-round picks in the 87 NBA draft, one of which was likely to be a lottery selection. Though experts didn't believe that next year's draft would be as good as the 1986 class. On this day, the Bulls also waived Mike Smrek, leaving them one player short of the minimum 12-player roster number. Joanne Oldham, who was complaining of knee soreness, was placed immediately on the Knicks injured list. He also kept any negative thoughts about the Bulls and Kraus to himself and reflected on the good memories and the chance that former Bulls GM Rod Thorne gave him. Fair enough. He probably did that with a purpose, I guess. Uh, now the trade had gone through and he was out of there, Yeah, he held back. Now, the Bulls opening day roster for the 86-87 campaign included Jordan... Steve Coulter, Earl Curitan, Charles Oakley, Granville Waiters, Dave Corzine, Brad Sellers, Johnny Paxson, and Mike Brown. And gone from the opening day the previous season were Kyle Macy, Orlando Warridge, Jawan Oldham, Sidney Green, and George the Iceman Gervin. So a fair shake-up, it must be said, from one season to the next. And we'll get into that with our next episode in the series, mate, episode two. For all of his detractors, Jerry Krause, obviously did a really good job in setting up the Bulls for their future with the, the trade of some of these undesirables, their free agents in Woolridge and Oldham, in order to have to pick up the future draft picks to, to pick up guys like Scotty Pippen and Horace Grant in the upcoming 87 NBA draft. That's right. That wraps up the first episode, mate. NBA 87, episode one is in the books. Uh, thanks again for being a part of this show, mate, as always. Absolutely love doing this series with you, and uh, yeah, look forward to the next episode already. Anything you'd like to add before we put a bow on this first edition of NB87? 
Yes, mate. Looking forward to the NB87 sweatshop yet again. Giddy up. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show. <laughs> uh, it pretty much is, uh, let's be honest, but great fun nonetheless. Are we going to have a bloopers reel this year? Yeah. A man named John Shasky. Does that name sound familiar to you at all? Yes, uh, I remember his Miami Heat card from the Upper Deck 91-92 set. Well played, mate. Uh, he was selected by the Jazz in 86, but released following the 88 season, having not played a game. His first NBA game would be November 5, 88, as an OG member of the Miami Heat. And by Miami Heat, I, of course, meant Seattle Supersonics. His 91-92 Upper Deck card was a... Seattle Supersonics card. Okay. Yep. His last NBA game was April 21, 1991, playing for the Mavericks. <laughs> <laughs> and by Miami Heat and Seattle Supersonics, I, of course, mean the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> oh my God. That'll make for some good editing, that one. Um, yeah, definitely. I remember his 1991-92 upper deck trading card when he was a member of the Dallas Mavericks. Very good, mate. That's a great call. <laughs> oh, history, hey? Good stuff. Um, I learned that the Bulls with Doug Collins at the helm were in Westchester. In Westchester. Can I learn to speak? Michael Holson, good friend of the show, uh, episode 72. Great guest, Michael. Uh, he talked about his career um, very lovingly. Uh, lovingly? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Um <laughs> He talked about his career fondly. How about that? Had some good stories to share, actually, Mike. Mike Holton. Yes. Mike? Have I ever called him Mike? No. No. How about Mick? Yeah, Mick. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs>